Hey, what's up everyone? It's Jared from One Earth Mushrooms. So I recently had the opportunity to join my friend Jane on her podcast, Farm to Future. And we had a discussion that ended up going way longer than we expected it to. Uh, the discussion was about, well, I bet you can guess, mushrooms. So we talked about uh, all kinds of different mushrooms. We talked about culinary, medicinal, and psychedelic mushrooms, as well as quite a few things about each one of those types of mushrooms. So their applications, uh, how to grow them. We didn't get into too much detail on how to grow them, but the basic life cycle of fungi and some of the new and exciting research that's coming out about the use of psychedelic mushrooms. I encourage you to watch the video here on my channel or head over to Jane's podcast, and I'll drop a link below. Let me know what you think. I'm excited to hear some feedback from the audience here on how mushrooms can contribute to the ideas that Jane's working with around sustainability, about how making the future of agriculture more possible for the you know, nearly 8 billion people on this planet. Enjoy the video. Thanks. Live here in the studio with Jared, aka the fun guy. <laughs> but that's not the first time you heard that oh, one. Oh, no, it's not. Thanks, Jane. <laughs> Maybe you could give listeners a quick background of who you are and how you got into the world of mushrooms. Yeah, thank you. So by training and by practice, I'm an engineer. And I spent a lot of my life just working in that very analytical, structured way of life. And I don't want to say that mushrooms are the key that unlocked something inside me to get me out of that, but they certainly helped. So about three years ago, I started to get pretty interested in mushrooms. I started to realize that I could learn a lot about myself and about the world through the lens of fungi. That path started by just really starting to discover mushrooms in nature. And then as I got more curious, looking at how to cult cultivate mushrooms on my own. Was it a particular mushroom that sent you down this rabbit hole? Yeah, the first mushroom I ever cultivated, it was a, a pink oyster mushroom. I, I decided to grow it basically because it looked fun. Like it looked cool. It was a, a different color than any mushroom I'd ever seen. And it grows in this way that looks like a trumpet. It's not a typical looking mushroom. That's the one that kind of set me down the path. But then right after that, I also discovered another mushroom called lion's mane. I mean, it's called lion's mane because it looks like a lion's mane, uh, except for it's that like it's like big white. and fluffy, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I it has was... these really long tendrils that come down and in the wild, they grow on trees. And so you'll see them like growing off the side of a tree, just dangling down. And they both taste amazing too. That was also a discovery for me that it wasn't just portobello and shiitake mushrooms that were available in the culinary world, that something like pink oyster tastes way better than any other mushroom I've had up to that point. I don't think I've ever tried it. What does it taste like? Well, they're really hard to find in stores. So they do have a mushroom taste still, but they absorb flavors really well. So if you are making a sauce to go with it, they absorb that flavor really well, but also just the, the texture of it. It's a little bit like chicken. Uh, so you can like actually make like, yeah, kind of, yeah. Hmm. More meaty than a, a shiitake mushroom. It's hard to describe taste. <laughs> I'm not a, a, a sommelier. <laughs> but uh, you know, most people have tasted chicken, so that's a good comparison. Going back to what you said about mushrooms in stores, like I shop at Whole Foods, bougie, whatever, but <laughs> they have like portobello mushrooms and the baby bella mushrooms, but not really other varieties. Do you have a hunch as to why more varieties of mushrooms aren't sold widely? I think it's just the ease of cultivation. So portobello mushrooms are really easy to cultivate. They grow in these huge warehouses where they have these beds of compost and manure mixed together that they create the perfect environment in a really easy way to grow the mushrooms. And then portobellos store and ship really well. So you can have a huge warehouse, say in New Jersey, and then you can ship from there to New York City and Boston and Albany. And you can serve quite a large area with this one warehouse. Mm. Whereas something like an oyster mushroom requires a slightly different growing medium. Well, oysters will grow on literally anything, but the ideal substrate for an oyster is wood chips. So huh. it's a little bit more expensive to be growing on wood. It's more labor intensive. 
they grow slower. So I think it's just, there's not a lot of profit there. But it's interesting. There's so many varieties of mushrooms out there. Like what a loss for mainstream food, right? Can you just walk us through some basic definitions of what fungi means? What the heck is mycelium and <laughs> what is mushroom in a technical sense? Yeah, so fungi is the kingdom that these types of living beings, these organisms fall under. So like animals would be in their own kingdom, plants would be in a different kingdom and fungi is its own kingdom. So it's this entire category of mushrooms. So the mushroom is the fruiting body. And really what that is, is the reproductive organ. So the organism itself is the mycelial network that grows underground or in the tree, in the decaying matter. Every mushroom is very specialized in what it grows on. Some really like wood. And so they break down dead trees. Some even grow on living trees and they feed off of the bark of the tree. Others grow on decaying leaves or in soil. The role that fungi plays in nature is death. It's really facilitating what happens after death. So whether that's an animal or even a human, eventually we will be consumed by fungi or trees or grass or whatever it is. Fungi is one of the main ways that dead organisms are broken down and returned into the cycle of life. Now, bacteria also plays a role here, but fungi also gives us this opportunity to enjoy the fruits of that. The fruits of death. <laughs> the fruits of death, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And as I mentioned, each type of mushroom has its own specialty. Just as like a cool example or a, maybe a scary example, there's this type of fungi called Cordyceps militaris. And cordyceps tend to feast on or thrive on insects, living insects. So what will happen is an ant will crawl along the forest floor and discover this spore from a cordyceps fungus, and it will eat that spore. That spore will then trick the ant by colonizing its brain with mycelium, and it hijacks the neural network of the ant and causes the ant to climb to the highest point that it can find. So whether that's a tree or the chimney of your house or whatever it is. So the ant climbs up high and then sinks its mandibles into the bark of the tree and then dies. The mushroom then grows out the back of the animal's brain, releases its spores into the wind, and then that happens again. Another ant comes oh along God. and finds the spores on the ground and the cycle continues. Wow, that is some next level, like <laughs> AI, Elon Musk, brain chip <laughs> stuff. <Yeah. laughs> oh my God. Do you know where they grow? That one in particular seems to be more prevalent in parts of Asia. It can be intentionally cultivated. I've attempted to cultivate it, not successfully, oh. but... Yeah, Wait, did you, you have you can... to like buy ants or something? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's actually a way to do it using a different kind of substrate. So no, mm. no living ants were harmed in my experiment. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. Yeah, no dead ants either. You can grow it on a plant-based substrate. I, I was actually trying to create a liquid culture and then I was going to dry that out and use the dried mycelium as a supplement. The thing about cordyceps is it's actually performance enhancing in a way. A human that consumes it gives them energy. So actually there's athletes that use it. I think there was a, a team in a recent Olympics that there was questions about how their performance was so high and they were able to trace that back to the use of cordyceps. Huh. It does appear in a few supplements. And it's supposed to so. enhance athletic performance? Yeah, I mean energy really. And I guess yeah. that those components come from the ant brain and the trees that they're feeding off of, because that's where the mushroom mm. derives its nutrition, right? Is from the substrate that it feeds off of. Yeah. Well, it's, there's some really complex chemistry that's happening when a mushroom is actually growing. So it's converting all of the carbohydrates and whatever it is consuming and all the other micronutrients into compounds, every different kind of mushroom creates different compounds. For example, a psilocybin 
mushroom or a, like a psilocybe creates psilocybin and psilocin, but that's growing from manure or from some pretty basic substrates. So the magic that happens there is how that organism is able to create those compounds from not a whole lot, just from carbohydrates and carbon hmm. that it finds in its substrates. So I don't necessarily think that cordyceps is you're eating ants right. or eating whatever <laughs> insect it grew on. Okay. So it's not like if the mushroom I'm eating fed off of grains and I'm gluten-free, I can still technically have those mushrooms. Sure. Right. Um, can we talk mushroom nutrition Generally, are there certain nutrients and minerals you're going to find in all types of mushrooms? And what mushrooms would you go for for like certain nutrients? There are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of different kinds of mushrooms out there. And each one produces something different. So I mentioned the lion's mane mushroom. That one is really beneficial for our brains, for facilitating neuroplasticity and our ability to learn, or you can look at something like turkey tail. That one actually has some anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer properties. We've mentioned psilocybe mushrooms or mushrooms that contain psilocybin. Those also have a pretty profound impact on the brain, not just for having a trip or having a, a journey on that medicine, but it's also can be really beneficial for things like depression or PTSD or addiction. So I, I can't tell you go eat enoki mushrooms because it's going to boost vitamin D or iron or anything like that. That nutrition value, I just can't speak to it personally. Yeah. After I asked, I, I kind of realized that's kind of like asking what are the nutritional properties of all vegetables or all fruits? <laughs> <laughs> You're right. They're all different yeah. varieties. And I think because I, and probably a lot of people grew up with only seeing a handful of mushroom varieties, we just assume like all mushrooms look like this, taste like this and have similar nutritional properties. But Let's talk about the fungus life cycle and what it takes to actually start cultivating mushrooms at home. So, you know, I, I live in an urban apartment in Boston. I don't know if that's the right growing conditions, <laughs> but let's say I want to start growing something that's pretty easy to cultivate at home. Where would you have me start? Yeah. So anyone can grow mushrooms anywhere. Mushrooms grow in such a variety of conditions. There's mushrooms that grow in sub-zero temperatures. There's mushrooms that grow in extreme hot temperatures. Typically where humans live, it's somewhere close to 70 degrees. So you can cultivate most edible mushrooms in the temperatures that we live in. You also don't need a lot of space. There's ways to do it in as small as like one cubic foot. So you know, you have a plant or that might be a fake plant behind you. I can't tell, but oh, it's real. <laughs> yeah, in, <laughs> in the same space that <laughs> nice, it looks good. Thanks. In the same space that you could grow that plant, you could also grow mushrooms in that space. And so if someone comes to me and they say, I want to start growing mushrooms, where can I start? I would say, go find a ready to go kit and you can buy, it's literally a a box that you get in the mail, you open it and you cut a little slit in it and you spray some water on it. And then within a couple of weeks, you have mushrooms. It requires very little maintenance. It's low cost. I mean, you might spend $20 on a ready to go mushroom box. And I think that's a really good starting point for most people. From there, if you're finding yourself to be excited about, you know, watching the mushroom grow and then being able to consume it, you can get a little bit deeper. So you can go buy pre-made grain spawn and I'll, I'll get into these definitions a little bit, but pre-made pre-sterilized grain spawn and a syringe that has spores in it. And then you can grow your own mycelium and then transfer that onto a growing medium, whether that's wood chips or cocoa coir and vermiculite or manure. So you can definitely scale up from just using that small box. That small box, yeah. does that just give you one harvest or can you kind of reuse that indefinitely? It definitely varies by where you buy it from and how well you take care of it. But yes, most of those do grow 
multiple times. Each batch is called a flush. So each time you harvest it, the, the mushroom will, will grow back until eventually it will run out of nutrients in the substrate that it's growing on. So you could probably grow like three flushes, at least from one of those boxes. You're not going to have pounds of mushrooms there, but you know, each time you harvest it, it'll be enough for one meal. You asked also about the life cycle. So we can really start at any point, but we'll just start with a fruiting body. So the mushroom that we see growing out of the ground in our yard or in the woods, that is the reproductive organ of the mushroom. Typically that fruiting body's purpose is to bring spores into the world in the cap of it, in the top of the mushroom, it has millions of these, think of it like sperm mm. or eggs that eventually when the mushroom gets to the right stage, it will open the cap and then all those spores will fall out and the wind will carry it out into another part of the forest or the field. Those spores, 99.99% .99 of them won't do anything, but we're talking, you know, 20 million spores that blew out into the wind. So a very small percentage of them will survive. They will find the right environment to grow in. There is some sexual reproduction that happens. There's also some that produce asexually. So we'll just say for simplicity's sake that a spore meets another spore and their DNA works well together. They begin to create the mycelium and that is really the living organism. And if you look at it, you can see it with your bare eyes. And if you've ever like picked up a pot outside and you see like that white fuzzy stuff underneath it, it looks like a root network almost. It looks like the roots of a plant. That's mycelium. I mean, it, I um, guess it maybe picking up a pot is a bad example because it could be roots from, from right. whatever you're growing. <laughs> but if you were, if but you were to go typically smaller than roots, right? Right. It's very fine. It's like hairs. Okay. So that mycelium will expand out through the substrate through the dead log that it's growing on or through the soil in the field, the cow manure, whatever it happens to be on. Its role is to find nutrients. So it needs to find water, carbohydrates, minerals that the organism requires for life. That network might be growing for years before a fruiting body is ever produced because if it has everything it needs underground or in the log or in the cow manure, there has no reason to produce a fruiting body. The entirety of the world is covered in mycelium. Every bit of soil that we pick up outside, unless it's been sprayed with antifungal or so I would say actually a large portion of farmland in America probably doesn't have mycelium growing in it because we've killed it. Mm -hmm. But if you go into the woods or if you go into a, a cow pasture, it's going to be full of this mycelium. Eventually that mycelium will run out of resources and then it will it'll wait for a triggers to reproduce and usually that trigger is moisture so you'll notice that after a big rain if you go for a walk in the woods or through a field you'll see mushrooms growing up it needs a little bit more moisture to produce that fruiting body so the organism underground consolidates all of its resources to build mushrooms that grow up out of the soil and start this process all over again so we had a big mushroom flush, I guess would be the term, um, in our front yard a few months ago. And it was about a month after we cut down a tree that had died in our yard. There's something about mushrooms springing up in places that are damaged or that need renewal. Can you explain what was happening in, in that situation? I, I can't speak specifically for that organism, but your observation is very accurate here that mushrooms tend to thrive in places that have been disturbed. There are mushrooms that will grow on oil slicks. There are mushrooms that will grow in toxic sludge from mining operations. There's mushrooms that will grow in our yards that we've been putting all these fertilizers and pesticides on. I don't know that the mushroom particularly like cares what disturbed it or what happened, but it seems that mushrooms are growing where humans have disturbed it, or at least that's where we notice it the most. We tend to be quite a destructive species and we, you know, I don't think any developer is thinking, well, I'm really disturbing 
the cycle of nature here when I build this parking lot or when I build this house or the strip mall, but mushrooms kind of have our back in that area where they're helping to maintain balance in those areas that have been disturbed. Right. I guess the, the little ecosystem and the yard had this tree and all its nutrients and everything the tree brought previously. And now that that's gone, when you say restore balance, do you mean the mushroom is there to bring back nutrients into the soil? Or is it not that simple? Yeah, maybe not quite that simple. So mushrooms actually help plants communicate. They've shown this by going into a forest and taking one tree and putting like a, a plastic tent around it and then releasing a radioactive gas into that tree and then coming back months later and sampling other trees around it. And they find that the tree that had this radioactive gas exposed to it will have transferred nutrients, including some of that those radioactive isotopes into trees around it. And the only way that that happens is through the mycelial network because the root systems of these trees aren't connected to each other, but intertwined with all the root systems is mycelium. Going back to cultivating mushrooms indoors, you were saying, you know, if you wanted to go a step deeper, you could buy your own substrates and spores. So right? basically what we're trying to do is replicate that life cycle in an environment that we control. If we can control the environment, then we can also harvest the fruits of our, we'll pretend like we're the ones doing the labor. We all know that the, <laughs> the fungi is the one doing the labor here. <laughs> the fruits but, of their labor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we're trying to replicate what nature does. So if we want to start in kind of the same place that we did with the life cycle, which is a fruiting body releasing spores into the wild, well, it's really hard for us to go into the wild and, and collect those spores on our own. But there are people who do that for us. There's people that sell them all over. You can go on Etsy, you can go on eBay, you can go on Reddit, on Amazon. So starting with that spore, you can inject that spore into a growing medium. So the way that most people choose to do it is to find a nutrient dense substrate like rye grain. So rye grain is just a seed that's been dried out. We can rehydrate it and then add the spores from whatever mushroom we're trying to cultivate into that rye grain. When that starts growing mycelium, it's considered grain spawn. After that grain spawn has been fully colonized, meaning that the mycelium has spread itself over all of the grain, we can transfer that into a cheaper and also less nutrient dense growing medium. And we call that the bulk substrate. So that could be wood chips, that could be uh, coco coir and vermiculite or manure. Those are the three most commonly used substrates. From there, the mycelium will spread itself out through that entire substrate. Once it's fully colonized that substrate, now it's starting to run short on resources. So it will grow a fruiting body and try to reproduce as it would in nature. But that fruiting body is now where we get to harvest it and then consume it. So you can go into this in stages. You can buy the rye grain already prepared, sterilized, hydrated, and ready to go. And then buy the spores and inject the spores into that rye grain. And then we can buy the, the bulk substrate in a, a similar fashion that's already prepared, perfectly ready to go. All we need to do is find a container to grow it in, mix the two together, and then we're off running. We'll call that like stage one. Well, we'll call it stage two, because stage one was like buying the box that was ready to go. Stage two is buying pre-made substrates. Stage three would be to now start making your own substrates. So to buy dry rye grain, to buy dry vermiculite and coca coir, and do all the sterilization and hydration of those substrates yourself, and then still buying spores from a commercial source. We'll call that stage three. That's a little bit more difficult, requires more equipment. You usually have to have a pressure cooker. So just a little bit bigger of a capital investment. And then kind of the final stage, stage four, we'll call it, is where you're now collecting your own spores. So when you harvest those mushrooms at the end of the cycle, you save one or two of them and you harvest the spores from those mushrooms. And now you have your own source of spores that you can start that cycle again. That's the most difficult. It requires lab techniques. You need to be working in a very sterile environment, usually 
with a flow hood or some way to ensure that the only spores that you are introducing are the spores that you want to. Because mm -hmm. like, like it or not, the air that we breathe is full of spores from all kinds of different fungus, full of bacteria, full of all these things that we don't want to grow. So if you're trying to collect your own spores for growing, you can do it on the cheap, but your failure rate is going to be really high. And spores are microscopic, right? Like you yeah. can't see them with the naked eye. So you'd have to harvest them under a microscope? Not really. The The way they're harvested is is actually kind of simple. You You take the cap of the mushroom and you set that onto, say, a piece of glass. But, you know, this glass has to be in a sterile environment. The glass itself needs to be sterile. The spores are still going to drop off of that, and then they'll collect on the glass. Mm. And then you can use, like, a scalpel to scrape the... At this point, they are visible because you have so many... Mm. You have, you know, 20 million spores in an area this small. Mm -hmm. So you, you can see them at that point. Um, and what do they look like? So if you if you imagine the underside of a mushroom cap... And it has all of the, the gills, you know, all the lines that go to the center. It's like a print of the oh. underside of the mushroom onto the glass or onto the tin foil or whatever you're collecting the spores on. They're actually quite beautiful. If you do a Google search for like a spore print, you'll be able to see people make art out of spores. I, I, oh, I think wow. they're pretty cool. I've, I've done a few myself. It kind of looks like an iris of an eye. That's yeah, super cool. Yeah. Wow. What's the timeline of when you inoculate a, a substrate to when you can harvest? Well, it, it very much depends on the type of mushroom that you're growing. But for like, we'll say an oyster, the first stage of creating the grain spawn takes, we'll say about three weeks for that substrate to, to colonize completely. And then once you transfer that over into the bulk substrate, about another two weeks for to fully colonize that. And then week and a half or so for the fruiting bodies to start producing. So if we add that up, it's probably two and a half months from start to finish. There are other types of mushrooms that grow much faster, but two and a half to three months is, is pretty typical. And you can grow like all year long. There's not necessarily seasons. Yeah. So mushrooms don't depend on light a whole lot. Light is an input to the growing cycle. But I mean, as, as we see in nature, we can go to sleep and the yard is completely clean. We'll wake up in the morning and it's full of mushrooms. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily dependent so much on light. Temperature and moisture play a bigger role than light does. You yeah. get them all year round. <laughs> yeah. Shall we switch gears and talk about magic mushrooms? Oh, I would love to. <laughs> so how did you get into this topic? So... I grew up in a pretty conservative Christian background and anything that was labeled a drug was automatically bad. So it didn't matter if it was cannabis or mushrooms or methamphetamine, those are all in the same category in my mind growing up. And so I had never considered that mushrooms could be a source of healing or of, you know, anything that I would ever even consider putting into my body. I think it was Sam Harris. I don't know if you're familiar with the, he's a, like a philosopher and we'll call him like a meditation guru. He runs a, a meditation app called waking up. I had been listening to Sam Harris for quite a while and someone that I grew to respect. And one day he was talking about how consuming psilocybin mushrooms early in his life made such a profound difference on who he is today. I was expecting a totally different opinion from him about mushrooms. I was expecting him to have something more in line with how I had looked at mushrooms, that they are labeled a drug, so therefore they're evil, and therefore, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with it. So I was really surprised to hear him say anything positive about mushrooms. That was kind of the first spark in my mind of, maybe this isn't exactly what I thought it was. Maybe these mushrooms aren't so evil. And from there, I did, you know, a lot of reading and listening to different podcasts that kind of demystified mushrooms for me, magic mushrooms or, you know, Celeste B. Cubenzies. The first time I personally consumed a magic mushroom was not in the greatest environments. It, it wasn't done in like a intentional way and there was no ceremony to it. We were camping and, but it was, it was so amazing 
to witness what happened to my mind after consuming this thing that grew in the ground for six hours or seven hours, however long it ended up being, my perspective on the world completely changed. But the next day, the entire world looked different. You know, when I looked at the mountains, I saw beauty that I had never seen before. And when I looked at plants, I saw colors that I had never seen before. And I wasn't high at this point. I mean, this is the next day and effects lasting weeks after that, where not just visually, but I began to see relationships with humans differently. I began to see my relationship with myself differently. That first experience I had, it gave me this, this shift in perspective that I had never experienced to that extent in my life. Before that, the only major perspective shift I'd had was living in Japan. So I lived in the United States for my entire life. And then in 2015, I moved to Japan and I lived there for three years. And that was the first time I had seen an example of people living in a different way than I had grown up. So now to experience mushrooms, it gave me a similar, but much more profound shift in perspective. And at that time I was struggling a lot with some mental health issues with depression, anxiety, my mind and body, not having a good relationship with each other. And the way that I saw myself in the world was not a very positive one. And I had been on prescription antidepressants up to that point. I was on an SSRI and then an SNRI. Neither really seemed to do much good for me. I mean, in some ways those were alleviating the symptoms of depression, but the side effects were much more significant than the benefit. And that first mushroom experience I had changed my mental health in a way that was much more significant than any prescription that I'd ever taken. I, I do want to put in a quick disclaimer here. I, I am absolutely not a doctor and this is not medical advice. Really, this is, I'm just sharing my experience and I won't encourage any of our listeners to go do the same because I have no idea who they are and what their life is, is like right now. And mm -hmm. that worked well for me at that point in my life. It was a while before I used a mushroom again. I never really was approaching it in a way that was, we'll call it conscious or intentional. And I was shown things in those journeys that were dark or scary, or were, I guess what in popular culture you would call a bad trip. And then I had an experience with someone that showed me that I was looking at the mushrooms from a perspective that wasn't helpful. I was looking at it as just a substance to alter my perspective for the time that I was consuming them. And what they showed me was that you can set intentions for a journey, and that seems to align your mind in a way that facilitates healing. And so I began to become much more ritualistic about consuming mushrooms to, to do it in a way that showed respect for the medicine. And that's when I started to see mushrooms as a medicine, not as a drug, but rather something that can facilitate the healing of my brain and the expansion of my awareness or my consciousness. And I mean, ultimately propelled me into this period of growth that I'm still in today. And I, you know, it's not just the mushrooms, but it was a, and continues to be a tool that is very important for the dance of life that I'm in right now. Thank you so much for sharing that and sharing your journey with mushrooms as sort of this companion in your mental health journey. I myself have tried mushrooms as well on two occasions, and I won't say too much about this, but I will say the second time was a much more intentional journey. The first time I actually fell asleep, so I didn't really experience <laughs> it. But the second time, one thing I've observed was that because you're consuming this and it's in your digestive system, I felt like physically either attracted or repelled to different thoughts. So if I thought about something I didn't want to think about, like work, for example, I had like a visceral reaction, like my stomach actually hurt thinking about it. So I was like, all right, not thinking about that. <laughs> and the mushrooms actually reminded me of people I hadn't thought of for a long time, like my one friend and roommate from college that I hadn't checked in with for a while. And I think later that night, I, I sent her a text to check in. Um, but it's really cool, this conversation you can have with the fungi. 
I did want to ask you, you've been doing some uh, reading on the latest research, and there's been some studies that have come out around how psilocybin has been used for depression and other mental illness. Can you share what you've been learning? Yeah, and I, I, I do want to put a preface here that I have some real mixed feelings about clinical research on this medicine that exists in nature, and that's freely available to all of humanity, that now we're taking this out of nature and we're putting it into a pharmaceutical form and making it only accessible to those who have the money or the access to medical professionals. On the flip side of that, I know the power of what this medicine can do and ultimately putting it in the hands of doctors might widen the scope of who is able to access the medicine. So Compass Pathways is a company that's created a psilocybin compound originally de derived from a mushroom, and now they've synthesized it into something that they can produce in a lab. So they have a very known quantity and quality of the substance, and they you know put it into a pill form and then administer it to patients in a clinical setting. They just did their phase two Bravo clinical trial to determine the effective dose that will be used in large scale testing. So large scale testing is phase three. In phase two Bravo, they have a cohort of patients that they give varied doses to and look at the results and see which one had the best results and then move forward into phase three. So Compass Pathways just released what seemed to be really positive results that the psilocybin medicine was more effective than an SSRI in treating depression with very little side effects. The reason I, I am excited about this is a schedule one drug, which psilocybin is currently a schedule one drug. To be on that list, it has to have no known medical benefit. And so now what we're proving through the scientific method is that there is a known benefit to the medical community. Now, I mean, that's a little bit laughable because for thousands of years, humanity has known that there is a medical benefit, but using the scientific method and the presence and observation of doctors and researchers, we're now showing that it does have that medical benefit, which ultimately I think will lead to the U.S. federal government and federal governments throughout the world removing the restrictions on that substance, which will have downstream effects for people like you and I. If I get pulled over today with a, a bag of mushrooms, I could potentially go to jail for that, where if it's now no longer a Schedule One substance, the penalties for possession of or cultivation of a mushroom like that would be much less significant. One other thing I want to talk about, and, and that is how psilocybin acts in the brain. There is a paper that was written by Robin Carhart Harris, who is a mental health researcher. The theory is that there's these two serotonin receptors in the brain, 5-HT1A and 5-HT2A receptors. And it basically just influences the way that our brain responds to serotonin inputs. So an SSRI, which is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, works on the 5-HT1A receptor they call the 5-HT1A receptor passive coping, i.e. tolerating a source of stress. Conversely, the 5-HT2A receptor, which is the one that psilocybin works on, is actively addressing a source of stress. So it's enhancing your neuroplasticity or your brain's ability to adapt to change rather than just survive it. The SSRIs are, in a way, numbing our brain's ability to respond to that stress. It's just a thing that's getting us through it, where psilocybin is allowing us to change the way that our brain works to adapt to the stress and overcome it. The visual I had in my head while you explained that was, imagine you have a window. The SSRIs are kind of like blocking that window so you don't see the bad stuff outside. And then the mushrooms turn that window into a door where you can walk a new path and think about it differently. I watched the Netflix film Fantastic Fungi, which everyone needs to watch. <laughs> and at the end, they showed this study where they administered psilocybin to end of life patients these patients who have, you know, terminal illnesses or later stage cancers. Um, the goal was to use the substance to 
help them cope with the idea of death and dying and have that be a smoother, more peaceful process. And the results were pretty amazing. I think one of the patients said it was more effective than many, many years of talk therapy they did. I'm not sure how they measured the results exactly, but just qualitatively hearing those testimonials was was really heartwarming. Yeah, like mushrooms have been used in that way for thousands of years. It's beautiful to see that we're now pulling that into modern times and that we haven't lost access to that medicine as we have with many other medicines. You know, if you look at, you know, indigenous tribes throughout the world, the effects of colonization and the erasure of cultures and traditional medicines, humanity has lost access to so many different kinds of medicines. So we've been able to hold on to the knowledge of this medicine and we're bringing it back into common use. So I'm really happy to see that. And I would say the hope is that it remains this respected organism in the way that it's traditionally used. I fear that with it coming into the Western scientific and medical fields, that if it's just turned into a pill that you pop, that's kind of missing the beauty of it. Right. Yeah. If there's a way for us to milk profit out of it, we will. In a capitalist consumer society, there is opportunity for profit here. The beautiful thing about mushrooms is I didn't have to ever take mushrooms again to have the benefit that I got from that one time thing. Whereas with an SSRI or any other antidepressant, you have to take it every day or twice a day. Mm -hmm. So a fear I have is that science will find a way to make it something that you have to take every day to experience mm -hmm. the benefit of it. And I don't think that's good for humanity. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I feel like we could talk about magic mushrooms where this could be a whole entire episode itself. Anything else you wanted to leave with listeners? Yeah. So in, in particular, just around magic mushrooms, I would encourage that if anyone is interested in trying these kind of mushrooms, you, you really should be trying to approach this from an aspect of this is medicine. This is not a party drug. This is not something that, you know, you, you want to go take at a rave or just take casually. People do that all the time. And I, I'm not trying to demonize those people because th that was how I started getting into magic mushrooms myself, but it is a medicine and it does, it is worth your respect and your reverence for that medicine. Also complete shift of a focus here, but I do have a YouTube channel that if you do have any more interest in exploring how to cultivate mushrooms, the channel's name is one earth mushrooms. I'm about to launch my website as well, which has calculators and recipes and procedures on the cultivation of mushrooms. I have an Instagram as well. I would love to hear from anyone out there that has any knowledge or wisdom they want to share with me. Thanks for having me on, Jane. Thank you, Jared.